people. Who's heard of Skinwalker Ranch? It always struck me as more Bigfoot than Big Science, but I've changed my views. What the hell is that? You captured a UAP on camera. From the creators of Ancient Aliens. Everybody out of here now. Someone or something doesn't want us to collect data from the crime. After watching George Knapp, the famous UFO journalist, interviewing this guy, Dr. Travis Taylor. Dr. Taylor has amazing qualifications, multiple PhDs in aerospace and in physics, and he knows his stuff. He's recently been hired by Skinwalker Ranch to try and get to the bottom with an open mind of what's going on there. So I'm brand new to the whole Skinwalker Ranch. The whole name puts me off. And it's actually a big clue. The place is very steeped in North American legends and history. A skinwalker is a Native American term for a mythical beast who can take on various forms and is a scary figure you might meet at night, obviously from another world. But the ranch in Utah, outside the city of Ballard, has had some amazing sighting. We are nowhere near finished with our investigation. Comes the return to the world's most mysterious hotspot. We've got to do a lot more detailed experimentation. We're getting a spike in radiation. Everybody out of here now. It seems to be a center of activity. And that's the drift of my film today. Dr. Taylor and others are doing good investigations into what they see at the site. But maybe it's not the only place in the world where people see stuff. There are other worldwide sites just like Skinwalker Ranch. How about Angkor Wat, Machu Picchu, Lourdes in France, Stonehenge in the United Kingdom, the Dead Sea, Chichen Itza, Mount Athos in Greece, Mecca. I mean, <laughs> there's tons of places all over the world where people have visions, see UFOs, and have a strange feeling when they're at the site. It's often associated with their local spirituality. Some of the sites have been adopted by major religions, Mecca and Lourdes. But maybe that's the clue. What a lot of UFO research does is focus down to the granular level of the flying saucer. We see it in the Nimitz encounter, we see it at Skinwalker Ranch, we see it at Randlesham very much. But they all miss asking the obvious big questions. And that's what almost happened on the 28th of November, 1967, where we first found contact with little green men. Let me explain. This is a field in Cambridgeshire. Lord's Bridge. And this is Jocelyn Bell, a postgraduate student studying radio astronomy at the Cambridge University. Along with her professor, Dr. Anthony Hewish, Jocelyn has spent the last two years pounding stakes into a Cambridgeshire field and stringing it with chicken wire to make this a radio telescope. When you think of a radio telescope, you expect 
jodrell bank, a big steerable dish. But you don't have to have a dish. As the world turns, Cambridge points at different places in the sky. So you don't need to move the dish, you just have to wait for the Earth to rotate. And that's what this telescope in Cambridge was all about. Now I have to tell you a funny story which almost worked out badly. Amazingly, Cambridge Astronomy Department are rather short of cash. And so their students, Jocelyn being one of them, was told to run the pen recorder with paper in it and ink rather slowly so it didn't use up precious resources. Very English. So Jocelyn spent all day looking at this very fine details in this slow-moving paper trace of radio signals being picked up with her chicken wire antenna. And one day, she thought she saw something odd. Here it is. It's a wiggle. It didn't look like much. So she wrote question mark and classically LGM, little green men, and phoned Anthony Hewish, who was lecturing in Cambridge, and said, I think I've found something. You better get down here. Hewish looked at the signal and immediately said, man-made interference. You're going to have to investigate it. It's far too regular to be anything from space. But let's go and use a second radio telescope, wait for the exact position to come round into its field of view and see if it sees it. So with Jocelyn's coordinates of where the wiggly trace was coming from, they switched on the big telescope with a pen recorder going at high speed so it could potentially see more details in the signal, see if it really was a pulse. The time came, the telescope looked at the sky and they found nothing. After about five minutes, they gave up and walked away. Somebody in the room started shouting as Jocelyn and Hewish were walking away down the corridor. Oi, come back, it's arrived. There on the high-speed paper trace was blip, blip, blip. A perfectly regular pulse confirmed to be coming from space by a second telescope. Hewish, to his credit, thought that this could be something very interesting and called a meeting amongst the top brass of Cambridge University, including inviting the Astronomer Royal. For three days, they debated the granularity. I don't really like that word. For three days, they debated the small points of the signal. Its amplitude, its size, its where it was in space, how often it repeated, whether it was a definite repeat, whether it was man-made, or whether it was genuinely little green men. So why am I telling you this well-known story about Jocelyn Bell. What happened next is a learning experience for people at Skinwalker Ranch and any UFO investigator. This is why. Behind closed doors, men in suits looked at the minutia detail and incredibly luckily, but very rudely, they didn't invite Jocelyn Bell, who'd found the signal in the first place. Jocelyn is smart, and she came up with an idea, which is mind-blowing, and more ufologists should adopt. She surmised if what she found, this repeating mechanical signal, was the only one, it was very likely to be 
evidence of alien technology. But if there were more than one similar type all over the universe, it was just an unknown force of nature. So while Jocelyn was excluded from the top table and they discussed Little Green Men and how they should keep it from the press in 1967, Jocelyn cycled back out to Lord's Bridge and looked for another one. And it didn't take long. It was slightly different, but they're in a completely different part of the universe as the world turned Cambridge to point at a different galaxy. Blip, blip, blip. Another one. Another point source of blippiness. And you know the end of this story very well. What Jocelyn had discovered was pulsars. Neutron stars that are like lighthouses sending out pulses of electromagnetic waves and gamma rays which can be picked up by a radio telescope on Earth as the signal sweeps past Cambridge and goes beep, beep. All slightly different timings, but of a similar nature. And that was brilliant of Jocelyn. She proved that it wasn't Little Green Men because they were all over the place. And that's exactly what the Skinwalker Ranch people, even the brilliant scientists there, aren't doing. They're locked into their Native American culture. They're locked into UFOs. They haven't even asked the question, is there anywhere else on planet Earth that affects people in strange ways in the same way that they're witnessing at Skinwalker Ranch? Well, the answer is yes. There's visions in Lords, strange feelings of electromagnetic pulses, ley lines at Stonehenge, all kinds of places all over the world where us bags of chemistry get affected by something in that area. It's not little green men. It's not a Native American only myth coming to life. There's something about that part of Western United States as there's something about all these mystical places. That's what they need to look at. Not just to dive in and ask minutia questions, but ask the big picture. It's the same with the Nimitz encounter. Why did aliens only appear in a military operational area round an aircraft carrier visible to American Navy pilots. No, we're asking how they work. What did they see? You know, no, ask the damn big picture as Jocelyn Bell did because she knew the truth is out there.